ready to get started here. I am so excited to introduce uh, Rachel McNair, who will be our facilitator for this panel. Uh, she works for the Institute for Integrated Social, so Social Integrated Social Analysis. Thank you. It's the research arm of the consistent lab network. Yes. Um, my brain not firing on all engines this morning. All cylinders. I can tell. <laughs> 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 We have Annette Lancaster, 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 with uh, and then there were none uh, ministries, uh, which is the ministry that Adam Johnson started for former abortion clinic workers to help them get out of the industry and the life of early work. Um, and we have Thad Crouch, who's with Veterans for Peace, and uh, he's also worked with Consistent Life Network and a bunch of other great organizations in Texas as well. Um, so we have Annette from North Carolina, Thad from Texas. Good afternoon. So my name is Annette Lancaster. I was formerly the health center manager of Planned Parenthood South Atlantic. Uh, that is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I actually got involved with Planned Parenthood. Um, I was sought out by a headhunter. Um, I was working at a previous organization that was absorbed by another larger um, health system. And so I ended up looking for a job. I wanted to help people. I wanted to stay in healthcare. Um, my goal was really to help women. And of course, that is the, the undertone lie that Planned Parenthood sells to people. Um, I interviewed for the Winston-Salem office first, and I didn't get that position. And they actually called me back and asked me would I be interested in the Chapel Hill location, which was actually a lot larger than the Winston-Salem location. So of course I was really interested. Here's this large clinic that I can be the manager of. It's a standalone clinic. They help women. They do all of these different things for women. So I'm thinking this is great. Um, when I got into working at the clinic, it didn't take very long for me to realize that it wasn't exactly what everybody had told me that it was. It wasn't what they sold to me. Um, I realized that uh, women were being lied to. We were told that we did uh, the, the top number of mammograms and breast exams. And we, the first thing that I noticed was we didn't even have a mammogram machine. So how are we doing all these breast exams and you know helping women with breast cancer and all of these things when we didn't even have a breast exam machine? Um, after a few weeks, uh, of working there, I noticed that myself personally, I just started to have this moral decline. Um, my jokes started becoming very dark and morbid. Um, I started drinking very heavily, um, drinking to the point where it was becoming detrimental not only to my health, but to my family and to my marriage. Um, jumping forward, I'm happy to say that as of this August, I am completely sober. Not and I used to use that term loosely. I would say, yeah, I'm sober, and I'd have a glass here and a glass there. Um, but after having deep conversations with myself, I realized that I just needed to cut it out completely altogether. So I did do that. Um, but it, it was a really long and difficult journey for me. Um, I remember several times that I would have employees come to me, and they would be in tears working in the P what we called the POC room, which was the products of conception. Um, so I had my 18-year-old niece working with me at the time. This was her very first job. She wanted to get in healthcare, and of course I'm I'm helping her. I'm trying to get her involved in healthcare. So I'm like, I can get you a job at Planned Parenthood. You can work with me, 
and it ended up being so horrific for her, causing her to have nightmares. Um, just a lot of the things that she saw and a lot of the things that she did. Um, I'm happy to say that I got her out of the industry, even though I also helped her get, get into the industry. Um, but I was able to help get her out, as well as seven other people that worked in the industry at that clinic, um, and get them involved in, and then there were none with Abby Johnson. Um, but there were a lot of things that I saw, you guys, and a lot of things that I participated in that was just, it was horrible. Um, one of the things, it wasn't just one situation that got me out of the clinic and out of the industry. It was a culmination of, of a variety of things, but one of the things was when I assisted in an ultrasound-guided abortion. Um, I was not ultrasound trained. I had mm. never done an ultrasound before. I had never held a, I had never even held a transvaginal ultrasound. But I was doing, here I found myself as a manager, supposedly hired to do administrative work, and I'm holding an ultrasound for a day two procedure. I'm actually watching the baby inside of the mother's womb run from all of these instruments that are being put into the mother and then being pulled out piece by piece because that's how an abortion is, is performed. Um, people say, oh, I'm pro-choice, you know, I, I think it should be a woman's right, but until you actually see the procedure done, I don't think people really grasp how an abortion procedure is done. The baby is actually torn apart limb by limb. And after me seeing this and holding the ultrasound and actually watching this, something inside of me just woke up and I thought, what in the world am I doing here? This is not really helping women. And then after that procedure, I have the same patient come back to me and ask me again, after they had, before the procedure started, but come back to me and ask me, do you think God is gonna forgive me mm -hmm. for what I just did? Mm. You know, and so then I'm torn morally, and w with corporate life, what, what do I say? Do I say what I feel? Do I say what I really think in my heart and in my mind? Or do I continue to tell them what I've been taught by Planned Parenthood, which is the blanket answer of, well, do you believe in a forgiving God? Do you think that God is gonna forgive you? And I found myself repeating what I had been taught by Planned Parenthood to say. It wasn't until the last days that I was there that I began actually opening up and telling people how I really felt. I had women come in who were being coerced. They would come in being brought by parents or grandparents, boyfriends, husbands, partners, pimps, to have their abortion procedures done. And they really didn't want to do it. But I was being told by my regional manager at that time, oh, they're ready, they signed the paperwork, so they really want to have, they, they want it. If they didn't want to have this done, they wouldn't be here. But I found that after a few months, my numbers of abortion procedures were going down and down and down. Because as women came in and they would tell me their stories and they would answer their questions, my response would be, I don't think you want to have this procedure done today. So let's reschedule you, or let's just cancel your procedure altogether. Um, I ended up being reprimanded for that. I was told that my abortion numbers were not as high as they were supposed to be. So then at a meeting one day, I just came out and asked, do we have an abortion quota? Because I feel like we were herding women in like cattle. We were just bringing them in, like, you know, what, what is it that you want from me? Do you want me to just go out on the streets and advertise, please come in and abort your baby? You know, I was starting to get frustrated at one point. But I was told, no, we don't have an abortion quota. There's, there's no quota. You know, we make our money off of family planning. So again, then my question was, why am I being reprimanded? Because my numbers are going down. You know, it, it wasn't making sense to me. 
So after a few more weeks of my numbers continually declining, I was brought into the office and I was told, so, so let me back up a little bit. My husband had been telling me for months, you need to go ahead and quit. We'll be okay. You know, we'll be fine with just me working. And I was so hell-bent on, they're not going to break me. I can do this. You know, I, I, I can stay in this industry. I, I can do this. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not changing. But my husband was telling me, I can see you changing. The children can see you changing. We would tell such dark and morbid jokes. For example, um, the freezer where we kept the products of conception after a procedure, we called it the nursery. We had providers or abortionists who would, you know, talk down to the women who they were doing procedures on. You know, they would talk about them afterwards, talked about how their body parts were shaped or, or how they were colored. It was just, it was horrific. And I, I wasn't seeing how I was changing. But after a while, I started noticing, you know, after almost every abortion day, we did abortion procedures on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Sometimes we were there 10, 11, 12 hours performing these procedures. But after every abortion day, we always met up at a local restaurant or a bar, all of us, and we would jokingly say that we were getting together for our staff meeting. And I started to notice that I was using alcohol as a crutch. All of us were using alcohol as a crutch, except for my 18-year-old niece, who wasn't old enough to drink. So I started wondering to myself, you know, how is she getting through this? And I realized after a while she was using z -Quil and and NyQuil. That was what she would drink so that she could go to sleep at night and not have these nightmares or, or try to sleep through them. So I ended up writing a letter of resignation and I kept it. I didn't put a date on it. I wrote a really nice letter saying, thank you for my time here at Planned Parenthood. You know, you've, you've taught me so much, blah, blah, blah. But I never turned it in. And I actually had that letter with me for about two weeks. And I would keep it with me. But my numbers were still declining. So I knew that something was eventually going to come. And I was eventually called into the office and I was told, you just don't fit in here anymore. You don't fit in here. And it was like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. And I thought, you are you know, you are right. I don't fit in here with this morbid humor. And I had already gone to Human Resources and I had talked about the sexually charged environment, about the, the vulgarities and the, the cursing and this, the different things that went on. And I was told, well, this is just the culture here. So basically, I was being told, get over it and get used to it. But when I was finally told, you don't fit in here anymore, sign this paperwork saying that you're not going to disclose any of our patient information and leave, it was a weight lifted off my shoulders. And I gave my slid over that letter. When I, because when I was called into that office by two HR administrators with their folders, I already knew what was coming. So I had my folder with me and I was ready as well. <laughs> so they slid me their paperwork and I slid them mine. <laughs> Very good. Um, but even after leaving there, it was just so much that I had to deal with, so much that I had seen and participated in. And I had a card that had been given to me previously and I couldn't remember the name on the card because I had actually washed it. So let me tell you this quick story. The workers, sidewalk workers, would come and they would pray and they would talk to us and of course they would try to get us out of the industry. And I would always ignore them. I would call the police. I would have them trespass. I didn't want them on our property. So I would park across the street in a bank parking lot. One day when I went out to my car to take a break, I noticed that my car literally had been littered with these cards. <laughs> there wasn't just one card on my windshield. They were all around the front, down the sides, and around the back. 
And I thought, these people are relentless. They are crazy. Why won't they just leave me alone? They won't go away. So I took them all off my car, and I came back into the building, and my manager, really in a hateful way, said, you're going to throw those away, right? And me being the person that I am, <laughs> I threw them all away except for one. And I kept looking at it day after day, and I would look at it, and I would read it, and I would look it up and Google the information, and then I would close the page. <laughs> And I would look it up at home and then I would close the page because I thought, you know, Planned Parenthood's gonna find out that I'm trying to contact this organization. Well, when I left that day, I went home, I was distraught. I told my husband, I don't know if I just quit or if I got fired, but I know I don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Annette. You're welcome. In one month, in two days, it'll be 21 years. Surrounded by a brick wall, barbed wire. And the military police are saying, get in line. I was not staying in line, literally or metaphorically. I had already crossed the line, and I wasn't going back. I was arrested for the first time, crossing the property line, trespassing onto the U.S. Army's Fort Benning, Georgia, to protest the School of the Americas. It was November 16th of 1997, nine years to the day that an El Salvadoran death squad went into the residence of six Catholic university professors, they were Jesuit priests, and murdered them and their housekeeper and their housekeeper's 16-year-old daughter. The authoritarian Salvadoran government didn't like the thoughts of peace and justice that those Jesuits were teaching. So they not only killed them, they symbolically put some of their brains next to their bodies. I spent many times weeping and wailing and wondering if I helped train any of the members of that death squad. Because from 1987 to 1989, I was an infantry soldier assigned to Fort Benning, and I did support work for the U.S. Army School of the Americas. The military police kept screaming, get back in line. Yet my friends from Pax Christi and Veterans for Peace and others from around the country and, and I, we were 601 people strong, and we were already way out of line with our government. They wanted to use our troops to support a greedy, unjust, violent foreign policy of death, domination, destruction, and waste. It was a foreign policy that was dehumanizing. Our civil disobedience was a decision to be obedient to our conscience. And I gotta tell you, Back then and now, in the, is the mic on? In the face of feeling fear and stress that I might be in prison for six to 18 months, in the face of wondering how I might pay my rent or my bills if I was in jail, stressing about how this arrest might possibly keep me from getting a job I wanted, in the face of possibly being called a traitor by some of my army buddies and lifelong friends and family, then and now, I stand for being someone who follows my conscience. And I stand for being a voice for the voiceless in a system that silences them. And in the face of strong feelings of betrayal 
by the government and the army in the face and sometimes just feeling so angry. In the face of the temptation to react with anger and resentment. In the face of the temptation to judge and label and put in a box and dehumanize the government as leady, greedy and, and lying and dehumanize the members of that death squad. I stand for being someone who in my mind and in my heart rehumanizes them. Because then, in 1989, and right now, and forever, they're human beings. And I remember that I'm a human being and I remember that I, once like them, was a soldier who would have obeyed almost any order to kill. I trusted my leaders, and like them, I was psychologically re-socialized and trained to bypass my conscience and kill in command. And I remember the one who redeems me from that brain of death. In the face of those walls and that wire and those military police telling us to get back in line, we did not get back in line. We stood in a circle and we playfully sang and danced the hokey pokey. <laughs> <laughs> and it was at that point in my life, the freest I ever felt. It wasn't always like that. When I was young, I wanted my life to be about a purpose, not just making money. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I wanted to be an army ranger and jump out of airplanes and helicopters and kill people for freedom and democracy and human <laughs> rights. I saw way too many Chuck Norris and Rambo and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and, and war looked so exciting on, on TV. And I, I went to the recruiter station and I said, I want to be an airborne ranger. And they said, well, we don't have any more ranger slots. I said, I want to be airborne infantry. They said, we don't have any airborne infantry slots. You can be an airborne parachute rigger. I'm like, Tah. I'm Chuck Norris, right? Um, <laughs> When are you going to have those slots? Uh, next quarter. I'll come back next quarter. They're like, hey, hold on. We've got an unassigned infantry assignment at Fort Benning. I'm like, Fort Benning? That's where they have the airborne school and the ranger school. He's like, that's right. And every basic training class, the rangers are going to come by and ask the drill sergeants, who's just really kicking butt? Uh, and, and they can recommend you to be an airborne ranger. I'm like, awesome. And I signed up. And they dropped that promise just like I dropped the part of this microphone right here. <laughs> uh, and, and recruiters love. And we can talk more about that later. Um, so I went to basic training at Fort Benning. Two minutes for a while. Um, and um, OK, some of this I'll, I'll do in the parallels. Um, but. Uh, you know, there was a time that I was so proud to be a soldier. And the first time that I, I was in a training unit, I wasn't a combat unit, so most of my time was training our own soldiers. But I remember this time when my drill sergeant said that I was going to train folks at the School of the Americans. I never heard of it. And I was like, what's that? He said, that's the school where our military trains these officers from Latin America to protect freedom and democracy and fight communists. And I was like, cool. And after the first day I did it, and I did it several days, I called my mom and I was like, guess what? Instead of training our soldiers who might maybe one day fight Soviet Union, today I'm training these guys that are actually fighting communists to protect democracy in South America. And my mother said, I'm so proud of you, son. And I was proud of myself too. And um, years later, after some prayer and um, finding a, 
a Pax Christi group in, in New Orleans and after switching from a criminal justice major, because I didn't get to kill anyone in the army, so I thought I'd be a cop. Because gunfights look cool, and cops, you know, they always do the morally like, right thing, right? Yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> but I had this change in, in heart after prayer and I wanted to do something else, but I went to New Jesuit University in New Orleans. There was a Pax Christi group and they had a speaker there from Haiti uh, asking us to get President Clinton to put President Aristide back in, in Haiti. This was 1994. And we said, is there anything else? And he said, yes. You can close the U.S. Army School of the Americans. And I was like, what is this guy talking about? He wishes more of his soldiers went to the School of the Americans so they would learn civilian rule of law over the military and learn about democracy and human rights. And then he told me the truth. That the school was training death squads all over the Caribbean and Central America that were murdering, torturing, raping, disappearing their own citizens who were fighting against brutal governments to have the same rights and freedoms that we have. And some of them were fighting and some of them were just organizing nonviolently. And my heart wanted to vomit. And after a long period of time, it wasn't just a change of opinion, it was, it was this painful change in identity. I identified myself as a soldier and as a veteran, as someone that does good because the US foreign policy is always good and our orders are always good. And I couldn't stand in that identity anymore and feel good about myself. And there's a lot of veterans who, unlike me, I never saw combat, who saw combat and did some things that they might not have even had time to think about doing that maybe they wouldn't have done if they had. And they are, they're hurting. Okay. Oh, it's gonna be me with the parallels. Okay. We have uh, seven minutes devoted to the schedule for you all to discuss the parallels that you've noticed between each other. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of the parallels that, that you've, you've already heard really is, is you know, some of the lies in, in recruiting, them, them telling me that every infantry basic training class, they're going to offer ranger school. There's, there are a lot. Of, when you sign a military contract to enlist, the military doesn't have to keep a single thing in that contract. It shouldn't even legally be a contract. And when they recruit, they have, with the Leave No Child Behind Act, the military recruiters have access to student records uh, and, and student information. And they spend hundreds, they get access to school children. And the United States didn't sign the universal, the, the UN's uh, Declaration on, on Rights of the Child because the US would be in violation of it for military recruiting. Uh, persons under the age of 18. Um, another one of the parallels, uh, like Thad was saying, not only the lies, but the, the leaving you behind after you leave, when you leave the organization. Um, when I left Planned Parenthood, it wasn't like leaving any other job. Um, I, it, the way that I can best describe it is trying to leave a gang mm -hmm. or trying to leave the mafia. It's like blood in, blood out. And that's how I felt when I left Planned Parenthood. I was scared to call and then there were none because I didn't know what was going to come afterwards. And I found out um, not even a week or so, I, I think it was maybe a week or two after I had left Planned Parenthood, I got an email saying, if you don't bring back the week's worth of deposits that you took when you left, we're gonna file and press criminal charges. And I thought, what week's worth of, of deposits could I have possibly taken? When I left that day, I turned over my keys to everyone, you know, the HR people, and they literally walked me to my vehicle. So then I start getting scared. 
And I told my husband, you know, these are thousands upon thousands of dollars that they're talking about that's missing, and they're blaming me for it. And as the health center manager, I'm the only one who had keys to everything, as well as to the safe. So I had to think quickly, and I said, well, all of the cameras that you had there in the building, I suggest that you go back and review those cameras and review the tapes and see who took the money, because I don't have it. And after that, well, it wasn't after that, it was after I mentioned Abby Johnson's name as well. <laughs> <laughs> then they, they, they backed off and left me alone. <laughs> but it's, it's that parallel as well, you know, they, it, it's, not only did you leave, but we're gonna make you fearful mm. that you left. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the big differences, maybe one of the biggest in, in leaving the military uh, before your contract is up and, and leaving an abortion clinic is that as difficult as it is for you, and I've heard Abby's story to leave, when you're in the military, it's against the law to quit. You, you, and the consequences are, are you know, prison and a dishonorable discharge and you know, not being able to get a job that you might want because of a dishonorable discharge. I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about conscious objection, but I used to help conscious objectors if someone wants to talk later. But conscious objection, most soldiers don't even think it's, many soldiers don't even know they can apply for it. They think it was from when you were drafted and they don't even know they have the right to do it. The chaplains themselves that, that interview people for conscious objection, are offering them, asking them all kinds of questions, like, what, is, what are you, you're a Southern Baptist, what are you, you're a Catholic, they're asking them questions about Baptist and Catholic theology and social teaching. That is not criteria for being a kind, it's your own personal belief, is it sincerely and deeply held, and are you opposed to all war, you couldn't participate in any war. So, I wanna say here today, we're in this Catholic university, it's against the law to fully practice your Catholicism in the military. Because if you want to say, hey, I'm willing to fight and kill to defend my country in a just war, but I'm not going to take part in an unjust war, if you don't know who those are, come talk to me afterwards, uh, that's against the law. If you become a military pacifist, no war, legal. Um, the, the Supreme Court heard a case about this in 1971. The vote was eight to one didn't matter how many thousands of years there's been church teaching on just war. No. Incidentally, seven out of those nine justices also voted on Roe, also reinstated the death penalty. Just saying. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, another thing is, is, is some of the language that's, that's really dehumanizing. Um, I heard POC, uh, you know, there's so much stuff in the military that, you know, um, it's an enemy, then it's not an enemy, it's a target, then it's not a target, it's tango, because that's the phonetic alphabet for T, and you kill someone and it's tango down, um, you, you fire a missile and his package is delivered, um, and then, I'm really sorry, I'm going to say the C word, collateral damage are innocent people that, you know, when you look at modern warfare, depending on who you read and what you look at, can be as high as 90% or maybe as low as 40% of the people killed by militaries are not the other enemies. They're, they're innocent civilians. They're, they're women and children. And we justify that by calling it collateral damage. And many of us in this country We'll think about that and what terrorists do and think that's okay. And I like to ask this question. What action do you think our nation or our country could do or has done that you think would justify some other country bombing your neighborhood, burning down your house, killing your children, and calling them collateral damage? It was the same way in Planned Parenthood. A lot of the verbiage and a lot of the terms that we used were very dehumanizing. Um, like I said, we called the POC freezer the nursery. 
Um, not only that, a lot of the providers, as they were working with women, um, they would make just rude and crude remarks, like I said, about, about their vaginas, about the, the shape or the smell or just, just rude and crude things. I remember I had a provider one time tell a woman, you know, she said she couldn't take the procedure. Well, you, obviously something was stuck in there before, so you can take this. You know, just, and, and you would think to yourself that it would be shocking to hear, but after you hear, hear that so many times, and after you hear providers say this to women, you start dehumanizing the women, and you start thinking the same thing for the next client and the next patient that comes through. Well, why are you crying? Why are you acting like this is painful? You had something in there before, and we would actually laugh at these jokes and at these crude and rude things that the doctors would say, and we would mimic it. We would mm -hmm. repeat it, mm -hmm. and we would say it to other people. Um, Okay, uh, we, have, we are on time on, on this, so you have something more pressing to say? No. Um, I, real quickly, can I think, in, you know, in the military, uh, mimicking and repeating is mandatory. Mm -hmm. There's marching cadences. There's songs about killing. The drill sergeant is saying, what is the spirit of the bayonet? And you're saying, to kill, kill, kill. We're marching, singing, so this was in the 1980s. We're still singing songs, racist songs about Vietnam, about killing gooks. We're using the word gooks for Asian people. Uh, we're singing songs, dehumanizing women. Um, the army, after World War II, realized enough people weren't firing at the enemy, so they employed social psychologists and psychologists to, to re-socialize people to kill move from bullseyes to pop up targets that pop down really quick so you only have a second to shoot them. Um, they brought in, during my training, a supposed Russian officer and made up some story about why he got to address us and he was insulting us and saying, if your capital system's so good, why did you even enlist in the army? It's because your mothers and sisters don't make enough money on the street. And I was taking notes that Russians were a-holes I could not wait to go to war and kill these a-holes. This is using psychology intentionally to dehumanize people.
is expected. So I said, well, before I even look at abortion, I'm going to have to look at it. Is killing traumatizing across combat veterans, executions, uh, criminal homicides, police who shoot in the line of duty? The police who shoot in the line of duty was the exception to prove the rule. There was a, a, a huge amount of um, literature saying, yes, they were traumatized by doing the shooting, but that but that was because it was the criminal's fault, not theirs. So all the more that they were virtuous people and they felt bad about it. But the soldier was never allowed to feel bad about it. That was not supposed to happen. So I worked through, and if you want to uh, get web pages worth of more information, you can go to rachelmcnair.com slash pits. That's P is in perpetration, I is induced, T is in traumatic, in stress, so perpetration-induced traumatic stress, which is that form of PTSD, which is caused by acts of actually causing the, the usually killing, but torture will, will do it as well. Um, if you really want to get into it, I have a book called Perpetration-Induced Traumatic Stress, and that's uh, you know different chapters on different people. Uh, but then the answer when we went back to when I went back to looking at abortion. Uh, Staff, the answer was um, yeah. Now there was there was a study that showed that um, the, the the government had pulled together all these stats of like 1,638 combat veterans, and I was able to take that that information because it was publicly available. And there was one question: Did you kill or think you could kill anyone in yes in Vietnam? Yes or no? Which is a ridiculously poor way of asking the question, but it's all I have. So I divided people into two, and sure enough, the PTSD was higher in the folks that were killed. And then when I took uh, intensity of combat into account, it wasn't just that the people killed had heavier combat. Once I pulled that out, there was still trauma from killing. And um, as I say, you can go to the sources if you want more of the study than that. But that's where we have the study. The American database is it. Uh, the Israelis have done stuff, but mainly there's very little information on soldiers as a whole. However, in the next edition of the Diagnostic Manual of the American Psychological Association, I was at that time dealing with version number four. In version number five, they explicitly said in the um, explanation that went with the diagnosis that you could get it from, from killing people. So that progress was made. However, it was entirely, you know, if you're in the military. Mm -hmm. No idea of execution, certainly no idea of abortion. Um, a word about moral injury. Um, basically what happened is that the Veterans Administration psychiatrists started of this idea of moral injury and it's took the place of perpetration induced traumatic stress. And it has a lot of advantages over it in terms of that they pay attention to whether you're drinking or not. I mean, you know, why drinking wouldn't be a possible symptom of PTSD is just purely a historical thing since you don't have to have all of the symptoms. And obviously those would be a traumatized and it goes with moral injury and spiritual problems go with moral injury and feeling guilty goes with moral injury. The problem with moral injury is that by definition you have to feel, feel bad about what you did. So you uh, shoot an enemy soldier who was getting ready to shoot you. If you hadn't done that, you'd be dead now. You, you feel fine about that, but a three-year-old child got caught in a crossfire. Moral injury for the three-year-old child, but not for the enemy soldier. But with perpetration and his traumatic stress, it includes the enemy soldier. And this is crucial because most violence is done by people who believe it to be justified at the time they're doing it. And uh, I, I mean, you can get to a point where, where what you're doing is suffering the trauma and finally it becomes a moral injury. And then you get out of there. But the fact is that there's traumatization. You're being traumatized all along because the human mind is not suited for killing people. 
That's what I have to say. Um, resources. Can I say a little, a little bit yeah, about that? Sure. So, oh, let me grab this. So, um, just a, an obvious, glaring example of, of what could be moral injury or, or, or pits is when you have drone operators here in the United States flying to, they are in no way in danger and they, uh, you know, they're killing people and they have the trauma. Uh, something else that, that we've noticed in the veteran community is sometimes you can have someone with really bad PTSD and they have panic attacks and they're illegal inspired uh, and when they at some point calm down and are less stressed and not having panic attacks they can start putting memories together so and then they'll have sometimes have moral injury uh, where they're feeling very guilty uh, and ashamed and, and you have someone that you were concerned about suicide with for PTSD and then they were fine and then they were counseling other people for PTSD and then they started evaluating what they had done and commit suicide for moral injury. And so there's some resources for that. Uh, one is uh, um, uh, the Soul Repair Project, which you can look for online. And the Soul Repair Project will have resources for, uh, for veterans with, with moral injury around the country. You can find another resource for moral injury uh, is uh, the Catholic Peace Fellowship uh, in South Bend near Notre Dame University. They have a uh, ministry called David's Heart, and it's after in the, in the Bible there's David's Heart, he's grieving after, after war. Uh, and St. Augustine uh, talked about uh, a deep felt, uh, deep felt, heartfelt grief, uh, which, which we think is similar to moral injury. Um, Sean Storr, who runs that, has told me stories of. Vietnam veterans, 30 years after the war, who were Catholics, who would not go to communion because they thought there was no way God could ever forgive them for what they did. And so that's a, that's a resource, uh, those are resources for veterans uh, for, for moral injury. And for PTSD, there's, there's all kinds of things. Of course, there's, there's the Veterans Administration. <laughs> Uh, again, the great resource that I have for abortion workers is Abby Johnson's organization, and then there were none. Um, I definitely suffered moral injury uh, working in the abortion clinic. Um, when I first went to my first retreat and actually calculated the number of abortion procedures that I had participated in and seen, um, it was almost like I could relate to relate it to the Holocaust. Mm. And I was so down on myself, um, but just um, that resource of having, and then there were none, the resource of having the retreats, the spiritual healing, it was, it was wonderful. And I'm glad that that resource is there for ex-abortion workers. Mm -hmm. And the, the Catholic Peace Fellowship actually has retreats for veterans and also there for their family members and, and current military. Uh, there's several more resources I can name. I want to say, if you only remember one resource to help both veterans and people in the military, I would say it is the GI Rights Hotline. There are people who answer those calls almost 24-7. They're, they're well-trained. If they can't directly help you, they will find a resource for you. And some of those uh, can include, you know, obviously there's a veteran suicide hotline. Um, you know, and being with other people, other veterans, other military who have had similar experiences. Um, you'll get this a lot, but people, combat vets will say to other people, they, they just don't understand me, they don't, they don't get it. So there's, there's Veterans for Peace, there's Iraq Veterans Against War, there's all kinds of groups uh, like that. Um, if you, there's the, again, the, the Veterans Administration, if you uh, know someone that's uh, in the military, uh, and want to know their rights, GI right hotline. If they're wanting to get out, um, they can call the Center on Conscience and War. Uh, they've been around for 75 years, helping people apply for conscience objection or figure out other, other ways to get out. Um, there's also the Catholic Peace Fellowship also helps with that, um, predominantly with, with Catholic and, and Christian students. Um, this is really interesting because this is another a big, a big difference between the abortion industry and the military. The military's recruiting program is massive. Um, so there's actually 
uh, all kinds of counter recruiters and counter recruiting information. That, and, and what we have that I don't think we necessarily have with the abortion industry is the opportunity to talk to children that are of recruiting age and teens and young adults of recruiting age because more than likely a military recruiter is going to call them. They spent 600 million on their annual recruiting budget and they didn't make their numbers. Um, so there is a national, yes, thank you. There is a national network opposing the militarization of youth. Uh, and they're a great group and there's plenty of local groups around, around the country. Any other resources? Um, Planned Parenthood does the same thing. Um, Planned Parenthood has billboards up. Mm. Um, they actually go into starting as early as elementary schools. Um, they have anti-bullying, uh, um, oh, wow. what do you call it, campaigns. campaigns. And that is their way of getting into the schools to talk to children. Um, they, talk, they supposedly also do sex education campaigns, um, but that's their way of getting in and starting as early as elementary school. It's grooming. Yeah, it's, it's grooming oh is basically what they're doing. They're grooming. So when children as early as elementary school, they see Planned Parenthood come in for the anti-bullying campaigns and they see Planned Parenthood because of the sex education. When they become sexually active and they need to go to a clinic for even if it's just family planning, if they want birth control, the first thing they're gonna think of is instead of their regular local OBGYN or regular clinic, they're gonna think Planned Parenthood because they've been groomed from a, such an early age to come and Planned Parenthood is your friend. And another thing that Planned Parenthood does is they try to separate the child from the parent. And so their thing is Planned Parenthood, we're, we're your friend. You know, your parents are not gonna understand so you, need, you can come to us, you can talk to us about anything. And one of the things that was shocking to me when I started working at Planned Parenthood was there was something called a judicial bypass. So you know, even if your child comes in as early as 12 years old and they're pregnant, if they say, I have a fear that I'm gonna be uh, beaten or I'm gonna be put out of my home if I tell my parents that I'm pregnant, they can go to, they can get a judicial bypass. They can go to the courts, there's a certain judge that will sign this judicial bypass and they can have someone who's of the age 18 or older, just anyone, bring them to the clinic and they can have this abortion procedure without parental consent. And the next thing on the uh, agenda was how to be effective, what to say and not to say to troops, veterans, and abortion. Abortion clinic workers. Super quick, Amy gave me permission to jump in. Um, we have so many clients from all walks of the industry, and so I wanted to add to what Annette was sharing based on some testimony from some of our other clients who worked as community advocates. They actually, Planned Parenthood has a program where a community advocate, this is somebody who doesn't even actually work at the abortion clinic, they work for mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood. They're doing community service projects like gardening for little old ladies and things like that. And what they're doing is they are training students to be the sex educators in their schools as peer educators. And these teens are being groomed to be future abortion workers. That is their goal, is that they can train up these students to then start interning and working with Planned Parenthood. So that is an actual recruiting program that they do have. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of psychological manipulation that Bad was talking about mm -hmm. in the military and recruiting and training. Mm -hmm. right. right. And it's very- it's Do you want to address what to say and not to say to the abortion workers? Oh. So um, one thing to say, well, I, I wanted to uh, address also um, one of the slogans that, um, and then the Renan has, is nobody grows up wanting to be an abortion worker. And so Planned Parenthood is already working on trying to change that no. by grooming the children and having them want to grow up to be abortion workers. Um, but um, things to say and not to say to abortion workers. So I always tell people when, you, when you're a sidewalk advocate or you're outside, the best thing you can do is just be human, <laughs> rehumanize, <laughs> be human and talk to the abortion workers like they're normal people. You know, how's your day going? Um, you know, your, your outfit looks nice or, you know, just, just be a normal human being. When you're out there with a bullhorn and you're screaming scriptures and you're calling them murderers mm -hmm. and you're being just completely negative, 
you're not going to grasp their, well, you're going to grasp their attention, but you're going to grasp it in a negative way. They're going to, you know, they're going to have a manager who was like I was, who's going to call the police and have you trespass from the property. Um, one thing I remember is there was a sidewalk advocate when I was working at Planned Parenthood. She would never scream out scripture. She would never hardly even say anything but good morning or good afternoon. She was always there. She would come. She would kneel. She would be on the sidewalk, and she would pray. She was the one who caught my attention more so than any of the other people who were out there screaming you know, their explicits with their bullhorns. So yeah. the, the thing, if you don't take away anything else, but just remember this, is to just be human when you're talking to the abortion workers. We have um, another a, a client who went through a very traumatic experience and um, actually lost a family member. And she had sidewalk workers who were yelling at her, you know, this is why you lost that family member because you're working here. That's not, that's not a way to go about it. You know, the best way would have been, you know, I'm sorry that you lost your loved one. You know, is it, what, what can we do for you? Can we pray for you? Or I am praying for you. But to be negative and to, we had people who would come and bring miniature sized baby coffins to the clinic and, and just have them all over the sidewalks and you know, giant crosses and crucifixes. That grasps attention, but it grasps the wrong type of attention. You're not looking for a negative attention. You're trying to do relationship building with the abortion workers, so you want to be able to have a conversation with them. And the only way somebody's gonna wanna have a conversation with them is if you're loving and if you're genuine with them. So that's the one takeaway that I would have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annette. I, I think one of the things we're gonna find here talking is that whether you're pro-life talking to an abortion clinic worker or a peace activist talking to a soldier, which I don't find that super difficult. I find it more difficult to be a peace activist talking to a politician, but, um, <laughs> but you know, or whether you wanna abolish the death penalty you're talking to you know, someone who's wanting to execute people, that it's really about being human, mm -hmm. isn't it? Isn't it? And so before I talk about what to say or not say, I really want to talk about how to be. Like, don't be triggered and angry and resentful and, and presumptuous in these conversations. You know, you, you're not, there's a way to talk to someone where you can almost predict they're going to get defensive and judgmental and feel attacked and attack you back. The communication is not going to happen there, right? So look at yourself like what, what, you know, do some meditation, do some therapy, some, some contemplative prayer, some, some reevaluation counseling, just get some catharsis for whatever you're upset about. Um, uh, you can get uh, training in these types of things with reevaluation counseling, the, the landmark forum, the communication courses, authentic relating games. Uh, a friend of mine has a thing called Vision Force, and there's an honor window where you can look at how you're judging people and switch that to what, what is it they're standing for. Um, so talking, one of the things that, that I found effective and that I've learned from, from Vision Force is if there's someone that I had one time a conversation with the former commandant of the School of the Americas, and if you didn't catch it, I don't like the School of the Americas. <laughs> um, there was a protest of the School of the Americas in lobbying in DC, and there were like, I don't know, 400 people there to close the School of the Americas. Colonel Trumbull felt so strongly about standing up for the school that he showed up on his own, facing 400 people. And I saw him on a park bench eating. And I walked up to him, and, and this is what I said. I said, hey, Colonel Trumbull, I said, listen, I'm, I used to be with the 29th Infantry Regiment in Fort Benning and did support work for the school, so I got related, right? Get related to people. And then I said, listen, I, I'm here for this protest. I know we disagree on the School of the Americas, but I have to tell you, there's 400 people opposing what you're up to, and you came here on your own, and even though we disagree, like, I, I, just, I just want to give you props, and I want to respect you for that. Um, and when you do something like that, people can drop their wall, and they don't feel judged, 
and they're not guarded and you can you're more likely to have the conversation if you can even if you disagree with someone if you can get what they're standing for you know like someone who might be really pro-war they're standing for safety and security you know uh, and and what their emotion is and 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 have them really feel like they were gotten you know like like you feel them um, um, and then you can oh wrap it up all right so um i think actually that's a beautiful ending okay, point okay. right there it's a very right. beautiful ending point we are over time so the the uh, q a will have to be like over lunch these folks will be here uh so if you have a burning question go straight uh, straight to them and ask them so let's go to lunch.